Hello friends, my name is Reverend Darrell Goodwin and I serve as the Executive Conference Minister of the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. And I'm here to invite you to walk alongside our conference staff as we lead you through a Good Friday experience. As we lead you through a reflection of the seven last sayings of Christ. Tonight will be an experience that might be new for you and might be different for you to take the words of Christ in this last and tragic scene where Jesus really as a political prisoner was murdered, murdered because he was unwilling to succumb to the status quo, murdered because he was willing to speak truth to power, murdered because he was willing to say that all people were indeed children of God and had a right to a free an abundant life. The same words that Jesus spoke on the night in which his life was taken mimics so many of the words that other lives in our current context, black and brown lives have uttered as their lives were also taken. Their lives were also taken because of things like racism and white supremacy and an understanding that because of who a person was created to be, somehow a societal context said they were indeed less than. So we've been invited to say their names, to say the names of those who have been brutally taken away from us, but we've also been invited to contextualize the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus who spoke about the margins, the words of Jesus who spoke about drawing all those who've been pushed so brutally to the edges of our society and to yet again gather them in. Gather them in that we might be stretched, gather them in that we might be touched, gather them in that we might have a consciousness that the same relevant God of over 2000 years ago is still speaking the same truth to power today. So as we listen to these reflections on the seven last sayings of Jesus tonight, I ask you to contextualize yourself. Contextualize yourself in the seven last words of people in our contemporary society who should have still had the right to live in this moment. As you listen to the words that are offered by our staff, and you hear the words of those taken so brutally too quickly, I invite you to say their name. Say their name that we might remember that we are still moving to a world where freedom can truly be for everyone, where love can truly be for everyone, where righteousness can truly rain down like rivers of fresh water for what has seemingly been our parched souls. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Sean Bell said these words in response to a friend who held him after they were both shot by police officers. It was the early morning of Bell's wedding day and Bell had accidentally driven into another vehicle as he and friends drove home from his bachelor party at a Queens nightclub. When they came to the place called the skull, they nailed Jesus to the cross there and the two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, forgive them, Abba, for they know not what they do. As Jesus hung on the cross, breathing his last breaths, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Every time I hear this text, I wonder, who were the they 
that Jesus was interceding for, was seeking forgiveness for? Was it the criminals that hung to his right and to his left? God, forgive them. Was it Pilate who washed his hands? Was it Herod who sealed the deal, the crowds that shouted Barabbas? Who was Jesus seeking forgiveness for? The ones who knocked him down, the ones that spit on his face, the ones who whipped him, stripped him, nailed him. Jesus nailed him to the tree. Forgive them for they know not what they do. How did they not know what they were doing? Who Jesus was, why Jesus was, what Jesus was? How did they not know that he was the Messiah come to set us free? I wonder, did they ever really know? Did they know when the curtain ripped in two and the sky turned black and Mary wept? Did they know then? Did they know then when it was too late? Do any of us really know what we do? Really know when we ignore, reject, hurt, forget, sin against God, live with ignorance so as to not feel regret? Do any of us really know the pain that is left from our words and our wounds? What ripples grow when we cast the first stone or the second or the fiftieth? Did undercover officer Gisard Isnora and the other officers who shot 55 bullets into Sean Bell's car know? Did they know that these three friends were out at a bachelor party celebrating Sean's wedding to be held the following day? Did they know that Sean Bell, the one who was killed, would leave behind a fiancé named Nicole, and two children, Jada, age three, Jordan, just a few months old. Did they know that he was an athlete, loved baseball, loved his family? Did they know or didn't it matter that these friends did not have a weapon hidden in their car? Did they know that this young man's last words to his friend Joseph Guzman, who had laid his body across Sean's to protect him were, I love you. Two. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Maybe we all need Jesus to intercede on our behalf. Maybe we are a part of the they that Jesus was talking about, because sometimes forgiveness is hard. It's hard to forgive others, always hard to forgive ourselves. Hard to forgive others because we believe they had to know what they were doing, had to know the impact of their words, their wounds. Hard to forgive ourselves because, because it's just hard. How many times should we forgive, they asked Jesus. Seven times? No, Jesus replied, not seven times. We must forgive 70 times seven. We know the path of forgiveness is one we should be on, and yet it is hard. So hard. On the 10-year anniversary of Sean Bell's death, Nicole Paltry Bell was asked, have you forgiven the officers involved in the shooting? And she said, no, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat anything. I haven't, and I feel like when it's necessary, it will happen. But right now, we still see people losing their lives. We see no one accepting the fact that they've done wrong, and the justice system will not convict these officers each and every time there is an officer who walks away from killing an innocent person. Walking the path of forgiveness is hard. And that is our work. We are the only ones who have the power over our choice to forgive. And, and we are the only ones who can choose to be awakened to know 
to understand and see the pain we cause, the hurt left behind, the privilege we are unwilling to admit. Oh God, help us to know the evil we do and help us to stop, stop, stop before we do it again. Jesus interceded for all of us when he breathed his last breath when he spoke his last words, and we remember what he said the night before, when he said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Forgive them for they know not what they do. God, forgive us when we know not what we do and god guide us to do only the good that you would have us do amen and amen jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Floyd died after a white Minneapolis police officer pressed his knee against Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes while Floyd was pinned face down on the ground in handcuffs. Floyd was suspected of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. We are called to follow Jesus all the way to the cross, to Golgotha, to the place of the skull, which means we are called to search the deepest caverns of our hearts and ask how we to contribute to Jesus's crucifixion and the crucifixion of innocent people every day. Last year, following George Floyd's murder, a group of we local interfaith leaders came together in the town where I was serving to produce a message of lament and hope. Clergy person after clergy person spoke about standing in solidarity with the family of George Floyd based upon sacred teachings for love of neighbor. But two of the African-American pastors among us said things like, I hurt. And I stand with brother George Floyd because I have sons. Some among us have a greater chance of ending up like George. But a curious and important thing happened. Many of the clergy started to repent of their own sins of racism as they went down the line of the people who were lined up to speak. They named that they wanted to make change, starting with themselves. Back at Calvary, the two criminals sentenced to death on either side of Jesus were equally guilty of their crimes, but only one was willing to acknowledge who was innocent among them. Only one was willing to recognize and call Jesus Lord. George Floyd was crucified by an officer of the law acting under the assumption that he was superior, that he had the right to take a life. He would pretend to be equal to Jesus based upon the color of his skin. It is a narrative that is reinforced every day in our culture by our laws, our heritage, and even the images that hang in the sanctuaries of our churches of a white Jesus. I, as an Asian American woman who grew up in the South, carry my own racism, 
despite my parents' best intentions in raising me otherwise, because I grew up steeped in the legacy of colonialism and plantation culture. Every day, I have to be vigilant and choose differently from the narrative that those who were in charge wanted written into my relationships and my assumptions and my body. Which is to say, who among us can say, I am not guilty of the sins of judging another? Who among us can say, I don't have work to do? Every year during Lent, growing up in the circular congregational church, we sang the hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus. The second verse used to stop me short when I was in high school and college. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon you? It is my treason, Jesus, that has slain you. And I, dear Jesus, I, it was, denied you. I crucified you. I used to wonder, how did I crucify Jesus? And I have grown into the answer that we all did and we all do because we are all imperfect. Remember Peter, who never thought he would deny Jesus and then denied him three times in an effort to save his own life? The only one who is blameless is Jesus himself. In the same way, George Floyd's death and all the deaths of black and brown bodies killed by systems of white supremacy are also things to which we need to confess. Because the subjugation of black and brown bodies and immigrant bodies is written into our societies. It is a communal sin. It's an original sin. And dismantling it starts right here. And I am starting with me. Will you join me? For we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. If you mean it in your heart, I invite you to say it with me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen.
bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves, and blood at the root. Black bodies hanging in the summer breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Pastoral scenes of the gallant south, them bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of For the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the trees to drop. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your Amadou Diallo, a Ghanaian immigrant, had returned from a meal and was standing in front of his New York City apartment building at about 12.40 a.m. when four undercover police officers fired on him dozens of times, hitting him with at least 19 bullets. Minutes earlier, Diallo had left a voicemail for his mother, excited about his plans to attend college and earn a computer science. Kin. You are kin, Jesus says to his mother and beloved disciple as the breath leaves his body. You who have borne me in body and spirit, you who have journeyed with me in ministry and life, you who have shared with me my greatest hopes and my deepest fears, you who have been flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, are now flesh and bone to each other. You are kin, Jesus says to us this night as the breath leaves his body. Jesus, who taught us to pray together, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You are kin, not the way the world defines it, but the way I define it. I who am God's love and glory, justice and grace embodied. You are kin. You sitting in your homes, separated from community by a pandemic. You worshiping alone because few in your circle are willing to face the emptiness of this night. You who are weary and worried by the weight of life. You who have known pain and disappointment and disconnection in family. You 
who have been on a cross, have wept at the foot of a cross, have condemned another to a cross. You, kin. This winter, someone who was very important to me died unexpectedly. He was sick, but none of us, including him, knew just how sick. But through his death, kin were born. Earlier in life, some of his family had disowned him for who he loved and how he lived. Despite this, perhaps because of it, he created kin wherever he went. He found kin among colleagues and friends, among neighbors and members of his extended drag community. When he got sick, he created a social media group to keep everyone updated and to receive the love and the care we could only provide in memes and memories, in words of encouragement and prayer. When he died, that space became our sacred space. And we became kin. We shared the flesh of grief and the bone of love. We shared the DNA of joy and the blood of hope. We shared the multi-generational bonds of mutuality and the family tree of inclusion. And even though most of us will never ever meet, we will always be kin. On February 4th, 1999, Amadou Diallo was standing outside his apartment in the Bronx when four police officers came upon him. And before he could even speak, fired 41 shots, killing him instantly. The NAACP president at the time, Kwesi Mufume, called it excessive force at its worst. Crucifixion, the spreading of smallpox among indigenous peoples, chattel slavery, cages for immigrant children, misogyny, police brutality against black bodies, excessive force at its worst. Mom, I'm going to college. Amadou exclaimed this to his mother the night before he died. These would be the last words she heard him speak to her. Unlike Mary, Katiadu Diallo was not present at her son's death. She heard those words over a telephone line across the Atlantic Ocean. Nevertheless, she knelt at the foot of his cross and received them, both as a lament and a commissioning. Woman, here is your son. Here is your mother. Agony, grief, sorrow, hope, promise, new life, all spoken in those words. Mom, I'm going to college. So much hope and promise. And on the other side of those 41 bullets, so much grief and agony and sorrow and new life. Since then, Katiadu has accompanied other mothers like her, including Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Garner. In their grief and sorrow, they have become kin. She went on to create the Amadou Diallo Foundation, whose mission is to advocate for racial equity and promote education for students of African descent. Young people who with dreams of college have become her kin. These bonds of kinship carry on the long tradition of kinship in the African American community where the systematic separation of families began on slave ships and continues to this day. In those bonds, they share the flesh of grief and the bone of love. They share the DNA of joy and the blood of hope. They share the multi-generational bonds of mutuality and the family tree of inclusion. 
this kinship is stronger than all the death-defying forces of our world. Excessive police force, family disownment, systems of oppression, a global pandemic. Because it is flesh and bone of our Savior, whose very body is dying this night. Here is your mother. Here is your son. Mom, I'm going to college. Flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Love one another as I have loved you. Amen. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We do not know the last words of Leilene Extravaganza Kubelet Polanco, a transgender Afro-Latinx woman who died at Rikers Island in a solitary confinement cell after staff failed to provide her with medical care that could have saved her life following an epileptic seizure. Video footage shows several employees laughing just outside her cell as she remained in medical crisis. Cubalette Polanco was in jail because she could not afford the $500 bail. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Ela, Ela, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What a horrifying image. Already we know that Jesus is thirsty. There is no doubt the pain is excruciating. Perhaps the weight of his body is causing his flesh to rip in the areas where he is nailed to the cross. And there is blood everywhere. And finally, it seems Jesus can take no more. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, these are strong words. To forsake someone is to abandon them. It is to renounce them or to give them up. To be forsaken is to journey into forgotten places. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now these words are a variation of a lament that we find in Psalm 22, when a suffering righteous person cried out. That Psalm promises vindication and celebration. And I have no doubt that in using this language, Jesus who was fully divine was pointing to the coming resurrection and God's victory over evil. And yet this Jesus on the cross was also fully human. And I believe that as a human, he felt the human emotions of abandonment. And I wonder if Leilene Extravaganza Kubelet Polanco felt the same sense of forsakenness as she lay dying in her jail cell in solitary confinement on New York's Rikers Island on June 17, 2019. I wonder if she felt abandoned when no one came to her aid as security guards and others peeked into her cell but failed to provide her with medical care when she suffered an epileptic seizure. I wonder if in those moments, Leilene felt as though she was like Jesus in her moment of greatest vulnerability on display for all to see. I wonder if in the midst of the trauma and horror she was experiencing, Leilene found herself thinking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like Jesus, Leilene Extravaganza Cubalet Polanco was an outsider. Jesus was a poor, dark-skinned revolutionary who challenged the establishment so much that he was considered an enemy of the state. Leilene was a 27-year-old transgender Afro-Latinx woman, and her crucifixion began long before the day she died alone in a jail cell. She succumbed ultimately to the deadly mix of anti-transgender bias, racism, and poverty. 
like many transgender people, Laylene struggled to find and maintain adequate employment. Discrimination and other barriers disrupted her efforts to obtain further edu education. To survive, she used the only thing she had, her body. In 2017, she was arrested, charged with prostitution and a low-level drug crime. Now, the courts mandated that Laylene enroll in a human trafficking diversion program. Not surprisingly, as a person with so much instability and trauma in her life, she missed one or more classes. Then on April 13th, 2019, Laylene was charged, arrested with a misdemeanor assault charge. Her bail was set at $500, but a few days later, a judge ordered her release. But Laylene never got to leave. Because she had not fulfilled the requirements of the diversion program, her $500 bail remained. And because she was poor, Laylene could not come up with the $500 for bail. So she was sent to the Rose M. Singer Center for Women on Rikers Island. At one point, a psychiatrist would not authorize solitary confinement for her because she suffered from epilepsy. But although she had already suffered multiple seizures at the facility, she was ultimately cleared for solitary confinement, where she spent 17 hours alone in, in a cell each day. Policies state that inmates in solitary confinement are to be observed every 15 minutes, but on the day of her death, Laylene was left alone for periods as long as 57 minutes. And this is what the family's lawyer said about this. By leaving her locked in a cell unmonitored, the jail created the risk of Laylene suffering a fatal seizure. This is not a case of a mistake or a medical problem that slipped through the cracks. This was a thought out decision to put a person in a situation where the risk of injury and death were obvious and known. What are we to do with this? The late D Dr. James Cone, known as the father of black liberation theology, referred to Jesus as a first century lynchy. And at core, lynching is a violent punishment or execution without due process for real or alleged crimes. And with that definition in mind, I want to suggest that Leilene Extravaganza Cubalette Palanco was a 21st century lynchy. Sure, we could focus on the jail where she died as the site of her lynching, but Leilene's alleged crime was far more than a misdemeanor prostitution or drug charge. Her crime was that she was born an Afro-Latinx woman in a racist world. Her crime was that she was a transgender person in a world that does not fully embrace people who do not fit neatly into our gender categories. Her crime was that she was a poor person in a society in which poverty is seen as a personal and moral failure. And for this, she died. And we are all implicated just as surely as we had stood by and sheared as she was hanged from a tree. But we can be like the two women who watched as Jesus was crucified, then became the first witnesses to the resurrection as God defeated the power of death and dominion and initiated resurrection for all. We can witness the, the resurrection by working, truly working, to end racism. We can witness the resurrection by transforming the systems of justice in which people languished in jail for years without having been convicted of any crime simply because they are too poor to pay pay bail of a few hundred dollars. A system in which, as Equal Justice Initiative founder Brian Stevenson says, you are better off to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent. We can witness by doing everything we can to end gender-based violence. We can witness to the resurrection by ending our obsession with wealth and our current brand of capitalism and remembering that God created this world with enough for everyone and then getting busy to make sure everyone has enough of what God created. That, I believe, is consistent with, with the life and work of Jesus. It is, I believe, a fitting way to honor his death. And in doing so, we will demonstrate ourselves not as mere allies, but as co-conspirators with Leilene and others who have most certainly cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, so 
sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Las Vegas police said they spotted Byron Williams riding his bicycle without a safety light at about 5.45 a.m. on September 5th, 2019. Williams ran into an apartment complex, then followed police orders to stop and fall to the ground. Williams said, I can't breathe at least two dozen times while police laughed, joked, and continued to hold him face down with his hands cuffed behind his back. Jesus' thirst is understandable. He has been kept awake all night, beaten, tortured, and publicly humiliated. He is so weak that he cannot carry his cross by himself. He has been physically restrained, his body has been mutilated, and he is propped up to die slowly in the heat of the day anyone would be thirsty. But I find myself asking whether Jesus' thirst is about something more than water. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, Jesus proclaims, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The word we translate as righteousness could just as easily be translated justice. And we could render this beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be filled. It's important to note that Jesus does not say, blessed are those who want justice, or who think justice is a good idea, or who are willing to consider the possibility of justice. Jesus uses the words, hunger, and thirst. 
he uses words that describe dominating biological necessities. If we hunger, all we can focus on is our hunger. If we thirst, all we can focus on is our thirst. Because we know and our bodies know deeply that we will not survive without water or food. In the same way, people of faith will not survive without justice and righteousness. Byron Williams died while in the custody of the Las Vegas Police Department in September of 2019. His death was ruled a homicide. Byron Williams' last words were, I can't breathe, repeated at least five times. Oxygen is as necessary for life as food and water. Breathing is as necessary for life as eating and drinking. Perhaps we should rephrase the beatitude to read, blessed are those who hunger and thirst and gasp for righteousness, for justice, for they shall be filled. But they, really, we, will only be filled if we commit ourselves to making righteousness and justice a reality for everyone. And until that happens, we will continue to hunger and thirst and gasp for justice. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Sandra Bland was found hanged in a jail cell in Hempstead, Texas, on July 13, 2015. Three days earlier, Bland was stopped by a Texas state trooper who accused Bland of changing lanes without signaling when she moved over to let him pass. As their exchange verbally escalated, he dragged her from her vehicle and arrested her, charging her with assaulting a police officer. In a recorded phone call to a friend, Bland wondered aloud why she was arrested and jailed. When we juxtapose Jesus' crucifixion with Sandra Bland's death, we see many disturbing connections. Our Gospels depict Jesus' death coming at the hands of the Romans and certain religious leaders as they perceived him as a threat to their power and the structures upholding it. Consequently, he was crucified to preserve their power and send a strong, intimidating message to onlookers to stay in line. Yet, Jesus was not guilty of violating Roman law. In fact, John and Luke's Gospels record Pilate as saying that they found no case against him, and thus his resulting crucifixion was way out of proportion to his situation. The picture we have of Jesus at the end is of a person betrayed, alone, a victim of fear and jealousy, mocked, misunderstood, and humiliated. On Good Friday, darkness has its hour. Evil triumphs over good as an innocent, peaceful, loving, good man is executed by the authorities. But not just any man, an outsider, a Palestinian Jew, not a Roman. He was not a real or true Roman, either in skin color or cultural or ethnic heritage. Jesus was a member of a minority community living under an oppressive power controlled by others different from him. Fast forward to Sandra Bland, a young African-American woman whose only crime was that she failed to, turn, to use her turn signal. Indeed, she would say in a phone call just hours after she appeared in court where her bail was set at $5,000? I'm just still at a loss for words, honestly, at this whole process. How did switching lanes with no signal turn into all of this? I don't even know. Who was Sandra Bland? Who was the woman represented by the hashtag? Judging by the hundreds who came to her funeral service at her home church, 
DuPage African Methodist Episcopal Church to mourn her death and the remarks that were delivered, Sandra Bland was much beloved, a beloved daughter, sister, sorority sister, friend, co-worker, and a strong sister in Christ. Relatives and friends eulogized her by recounting happy memories of Sandra's Christian faith and activism. Church leaders remembered Sandra as a smart, forthright woman who once sang in the youth choir and had participated in the church's Girl Scout troop. After graduating from college, she returned to DePage, serving on church committees and befriending older members of the congregation. One leader remembered her as an eager, energetic, educated Christian who was excited about the future and who helped organize the church's recent Women's Day event. Sandra Bland's funeral celebrated her commitment to her sorority, her involvement in church, her musical skills, her college degree from Prairie View A&M, and her social media posts critiquing race relations in America. Like Jesus, Sandra Bland's life was snuffed out too early. At 28, she had just landed a new job with her alma mater. She was young, smart, talented, energetic, personable, and committed to social activism in order to make the U.S. a more just society. She had so much ahead of her, so much to contribute, so much more blossoming to do. And so Sandra Bland's misdemeanor traffic violation led to her being verbally assaulted, physically mistreated, jailed, isolated, and within a few days, mysteriously dead while in police custody. Like Jesus, her death was way out of proportion with her situation. Sandra Bland, like Jesus, was an outsider relative to the dominant culture, a member of a minority community living under a system that was controlled by others different from her. As with Jesus, evil would not have Sandra Bland blossoming, and darkness would have its day. Like Jesus, she was a victim of a death-dealing system that privileges some while oppressing others, that uses violence to maintain itself, and that stands in opposition to the God of life. Whether it be Pharaoh's Egypt, Herod's and Pilate's Rome, or our United States with its racism and white supremacy, all our society is characterized by death-dealing systems that violently slap down any who challenge them in their power, even as they try to bring life to all. Sharon Cooper, Sandra Brandland's sister, once wrote, My sister died because a police officer saw her as a threatening black woman rather than human. Black Americans' mere existence is perceived as such a threat to police officers that we're consistently asked to pay for our freedom with our bodies, and sometimes even with our blood. Throughout the ages, in times of pain and distress, the people of God have cried out, How long, O Lord, how long? As Abel's blood cried out to the Lord for justice from the ground, so too Sandra Bland's blood cries out for justice from the grave. As the Hebrews cried out to you, O God, at the slaying of their children, as you saw their misery, as you fully knew their sufferings and delivered them, dear Lord, so too hear the cries of your people in this land at this time. See our misery, especially the differing damage racism and white supremacy is doing to each of us. Know our various sufferings and deliver us from these evils. As you, O Lord, were moved to pity by the groanings of the Israelites in the time of the judges and delivered them from their oppression, hear our groanings and deliver us from the racist and white supremacist systems dealing death and oppression and infecting us in our country. O God, we know that how we treat one another affects you. For you have said through the prophet Jeremiah, my joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. O oh God, you know our sufferings, you know our pain. You also are the balm that can soothe our deep wounds. You are the physician who can heal us and guide us to wholeness. You are the shepherd who can lead us safely through this darkest hour. So we turn to you once again, again dear God, and ask, How long, O oh Lord, how long? 
When Jesus wept a falling tear, in mercy flowed beyond all bound. When Jesus groaned a trembling fear, seized all the guilty world around. When Jesus wept the falling tear, when Jesus wept the falling tear, when Jesus groaned a trembling fear, when Jesus gives a trembling fear, sees all the Jesus wept the falling tear. When Jesus wept the falling tear. When Jesus wept the trembling tear. When Jesus wept the trembling fear. When Jesus Jesus wept the falling tear. When Jesus wept the falling tear. When Jesus wept the trembling 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 tear. Sees all the guilty world around. It is customary to end a Good Friday service in darkness and silence as we participate symbolically in the death of Christ. In keeping with this practice, the screen will fade to black and the service will end following this final sermon. Jesus, Eric Garner died on July 17, 2014, after a New York City police officer placed him in a prohibited chokehold while arresting him in Staten Island. Garner was accused of selling individual cigarettes from a package. Garner repeated the phrase, I can't breathe, 11 times while multiple officers pinned him to the ground. Crucifixion is a long, torturous, and painful death. Crucifixion itself is not only the punishment for a crime, but the process by which one dies via crucifixion is also punishment. It is a debilitating, agonizing, dehumanizing, and humiliating way of dying. A human body is nailed to wood. That wooden structure is staked into the ground and the body hangs under the piercing heat rays of the sun for hours. Life slowly leaves the body of the one being crucified. 
Spectators are gathered around. Some are cheering. Some are looking in awe and wonder. And some are gathered mourning and are in sorrow, but they all gather and watch. The Roman officials are also part of the onlookers, making sure that the body remains on the cross until there is no longer any life, assuring that the sentence of death is fully executed on the one presumed guilty. In the hours that Jesus hung on the cross in excruciating pain, dying a slow death, and what strength he had left, he did occasionally speak. Tradition holds that his, the last words spoken before his last breath taken were, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. After offering this final plea, Jesus breathed his last breath and the spirit of life left him. The empire had indeed constricted his breath and obstructed his freedom to move and to breathe and the consequence was death. Nationalism has continued since that first century crucifixion to crucify and choke out the life of those they seek to minoritize, marginalize, and silence. In 2014, Eric Garner suffered a public crucifixion. Eric Garner, an African-American male 43 years young, just about 10 years older than Jesus when Jesus was crucified, died at the hands of the New York Police Department. The state's empire boasts as New York finest. In fact, the state of New York in the 19th century adopted as its nickname, the Empire State. Well, the Empire State's finest caused the death of Eric Garner via chokehold. In a public spectacle, Mr. Garner was pursued by two police officers while walking down the street on a hot July day. His alleged crime was selling cigarettes and cheap goods without legal permission. Because New York finers represent the state empire authority, one officer executed the takedown of Eric Garner via a chokehold, captured on a cell phone video. The officer said that because Mr. Garner was suspected engaging in legal activity, they approached him. And ironically, they themselves engaged in what is consider illegal activity as the New York Police Department had banned for more than two decades before this event, the use of chokeholds. Chokeholds are defined as any police maneuver that puts any pressure to the throat or windpipe, which may present, prevent or hinder breathing or reduce intake of air. While the public gathered, Eric Garner, like Jesus, uttered what would be resounding and profound last words. Under the crucifying control of the New York police officers' chokehold, and while spectators gathered, Eric Garner crying with a desperate voice, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Having said that 11 times, he breathed his last breath and eventually died. On this Good Friday, while we are still witnessing the disproportionate victimizing and crucifying and choking out of the breath of life of those from black and brown communities. How can we move forward 
from being complacent or complicit bystanders to being bringers of new life as agents of transformation. We can do this by, con by confessing on this Good Friday, the last day of Holy Week, by examining and confessing our sins that have been a chokehold to the liberation and the freedom of those in the embodiment of black and brown. By confessing our sins that when we want to go out and believe and champion that we are in a post-racial society, I can't breathe. By confessing the sin that's causing a chokehold of black and brown bodies when we see young African-American males with hoodies on that we cross over to the other side of the street because we immediately assume that they will bring harm. I can't breathe. When we as hiring officials look at the resumes of those from historically black colleges and universities as less qualified than those who have graduated from predominantly white institutions, I can't breathe. When we set up structures that keep people impoverished, when they, we deny them adequate health care and adequate education and the tools in their communities to be productive citizens. I can't breathe. When we do not confess our sins of institutionalized racism or implicit bias, when we don't recognize that just being in black and brown bodies and driving and being pulled over by those who swear to protect and serve. 